Good morning. Hello, everyone. Good to be here. Last day of Dreamforce. We're going to talk in this session about Flow's ability to build leading edge applications. Uh, I'm Alex Edelstein. I'm a Flow product manager, and I'm joined by our newest Flow product manager, Ruben Roy, today. Hey, Alex. Thank you so much for having me. I am so, so excited to meet and connect with more customers who are hyped up about building something new with Flow. Awesome. As always, please make your purchase decisions based on publicly available product. So a quick thank you. I am very appreciative to the Flow users and audience that basically make it possible for us to go to work and build this stuff and make Flow better every day. It is, it is my dream job, uh, and uh, I expect to be doing it for a long time. So thank you very much. Now the backdrop of what we're talking about today is explosive growth in the use of flow on the Salesforce system. More, every month, we're now into the trillions. 1.2 trillion actions are getting automated every single month, 40 billion a day. And then on the screen flow side, we're seeing 85% compound annual growth year after year. That means essentially that flow use for its screen flows is doubling every year. Now, there are a lot of reasons for this. The one we're going to focus on today is how good a platform flow is, how effective it is for creating applications. We're going to touch on five areas, and I'm going to share with Ruben five innovations that take building on flow beyond what you can do just building with basic LWC or basic Apex or basic pages. Let's start with screens and forms. Now, traditionally, Salesforce has given you two choices. You can go for the single page application experience of a lightning page or the dynamic sequential experience of a Salesforce flow. But what if you want, to, the, the, what if you want that at the same time? What if you want the, the responsiveness of a single page application but all the control and power of that logical, logical processing capability? Well, you may have seen in some of the sessions already, one of the features that we're making available that we're most excited about is called screen reactivity. And screen reactivity means that you can do more on that single screen before you hit the next button. Let's, let's look at it in the form of a demo. Ruben, show us what screen reactivity can do. Thanks, Alex. I am really excited about screen reactivity, and I feel the best way to illustrate that is by taking a look at the old and the new. So I'm a sales rep at a telecom company, and right now I'm going to try and figure out a discount for a customer with no reactivity. So I'm going to select the deal, I'm going to select the package, I'm going to figure out what type of customer, and each of these is on a different screen, right? So those are different steps in an iteration that each of my reps have to take. Now I calculate the discount, it's too big, I go back, I go forth. I move the slider again, and I try and figure out if it's the right size. And I do this a so couple what we're, of times. We're hitting, we're hitting a, we're hitting a problem. It's not, it's yeah. I not mean, it looks like the threshold. So you're having to go back each time. Exactly, and I mean that's that's frustrating for me. I can't imagine how frustrating it is for a team of a hundred reps. So again, and oh well, looks to me like they're having some trouble. You hate to see it, but now they got it right. So again, that's a lot of compounded time that takes away opportunities from a team. But with the new opportunity we have through reactivity, this uh, workflow gets shortened a lot. So in this case, we maximize the amount of reactivity we have, and everything is on a single screen. So we select the deal type, we select the customer on one screen, and then the most exciting part, or at least in my opinion my favorite part, is I can figure out whether or not the discount is too big on the same page, which means that instead of having to iterate back and forth a dozen times for every single sales rep, I can figure that out in this user experience. And we do this without any code whatsoever. That's a unique form of accessibility that Reactivity provides and why I'm super excited about it. And that's an important distinction. The developers in the audience the developers in the audience will go, I can build an LWC that does that slider with the re reactive updating, which is absolutely true. And that's how it's done today. What Flow is letting you do is create that experience on the Flow canvas by taking the slider component and wiring it up to the data table with very simple, very simple actions and no code at all. Let's take another look at this in the, 
from the from the lens of actions. Now, the graph that you see on the slide here is the number of actions, number of flow actions, invocable actions, or what we technically call them, that Salesforce teams ship every release. And you're not going to see all these because most of them are tied to some product, like a manufacturing cloud or something. But if you turned on all the different things that you can turn on in the Salesforce org, you would see 338 different flow building block actions available to you. And you can see from that last line that in the, and you can see this is an internal chart. We're using our internal numbers like 248. That's winter 24. Is, uh, sorry, 246 is winter 24. Um, so you can see that we're now delivering new actions that go into Flow Builder at a pace of more than 10 every month. So that's pretty substantial. Now, actions that you can build and that as an ISV or, an, or an, as, a, as a company, you simply are writing at, you're writing Apex. So you're taking the Apex that you're familiar with, but you can do more with it when you do it in Flow. You can turn it into that building block by simply using the invocable action mechanism. You can give it a custom property editor. That's really nice because it means that you can deploy a piece of Apex code in a form where admins can actually configure it for each individual use case using a property editor. What you see on the right side of the screen there is the property editor for one action that specializes in sending email. And that's really nice as a developer. That means that you don't have people coming to you asking you to code up 42 different variations of everything. You're empowering your larger organization. And you can do custom actions. What I wanted to share with you uh, for demo is something that was created by one of our most powerful Flow MVPs, Eric Smith. He's actually here today. You might have seen him showing this. What you, in this particular case, we're combining the screen reactivity with the power of invocable actions. So what's going on here is you have a data table that's allowing the user to select any combination of records. So you've got a tremendous amount of control here. First, you were able to use the flow to decide what records to fetch in the first place. And that can be dynamic. But then the user is actually clicking on the records that they want to process. In this case, the action is able to sum or count a number field in a collection. And you can see here that as the user picks different things, it reactively is calling out. It's running the action on the back end, bringing the information back, that sum or that count, and putting it up on the screen reactively. And once again, Whereas while someone had to build that action in the first place, just like those hundreds of actions at Salesforce ships, now that that's available to you as an admin, you simply hook it up in the flow screen. And if you want, I don't have time in this limited theater session mm -hmm. to sign a, kind of show you behind the screen and show you how that's done, but there is a lot growing, uh, a growing uh, base of content that you can find online places like unofficialsf.com, where you can see exactly how to set up your reactivity. Let's keep moving. Let's talk about some of the things that make Flow the best application platform for integration. Now, there's a lot of different ways. Flow already uh, provides more ways to integrate than, by the way, everyone, we've got some seats here, uh, so feel free to squeeze in if you want to. Uh, Flow already provides the most ways to integrate your non-Salesforce services into Salesforce. This thing called open AI and external services, well, a lot of companies that are out there that provide web services make a spec available. It's a description of their APIs. And the standard for that is called open API. These are basically text files that are sitting there on their website. And you can import that into your org, and it will generate all of the actions that make those web callouts. That's very powerful. And we're actually using that inside of Salesforce. We're using that open API technology to better integrate MuleSoft, which is our, it has this incredibly powerful array of hundreds of enterprise-grade connectors to all sorts of services, including many services that are very hard to reach with standard REST. 
So we are making it easier and easier to access all of your MuleSoft any point endpoints, your RPA endpoints, as more of these flow actions, making Flow Builder your tool that can create the most powerful applications. But the demo that we're going to show you today is our newest innovation, and it's designed to make it easy for an admin to very quickly create their own callout without any code. Ruben, what do we have? Well, Alex, that's even more exciting than it sounds. So what we have today is an example where we have a pet store owner who wants to communicate with their supplier in order to get more inventory. In order to accomplish this, they're going to need to interface with an external service, in this case, the pet store supplier's API. And unfortunately, having not majored in API management, they might need a low to no code solution in order to accomplish this. In order to get this done, we're going to create a new action, in this case, an HTTP callout, in order to liaise directly with the API that's going to provide me information from the pet store supplier about when I can get my new inventory. So we go to this new action panel, we select create HTTP action, and now we enter the required information. So I'm going to enter the name of the action that I want to accomplish. And then I'm going to enter a brief description and then the credential that I want to refer to it by. So that's the first step. So the name credential is setting up your authentication, creating a portable authentication credential that you can assign to users. There we go. So now that I've done that, the next step is going to be providing the required information about what the label is that I'm going to connect to for the HP a API and then the method I'm, that I'm going to use. So in this case, it's going to be a post because I'm writing to their API in order to get something back. And then from there, I'm going to specify the required URL path that I want to go read to. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. And then after that, this is kind of the star of the show with HTTP callouts, is I can paste a sample JSON request in this editor, and it's immediately translated into editable data types. This is a massive time saver, especially because time and time again, we've heard from customers that it is a royal pain to have to get some information from an API and then have some type of a mismatch. Maybe it's a, an API that expects an integer value, but you have a decimal or vice versa. This is something you can change within this user experience, and it's designed to streamline those types of inefficiencies. This, in this case, so we have like each of those data types outlined. We are going through and making sure that they match what we want from the API itself. And we do this without having to write any code. Again, allowing for this type of work to be accessible even to non-developer backgrounds, which is really, really exciting. So we select different things. So for example, we're looking at like date, time versus number in that field, right? Everything matches up. So we go through, we check again, making sure the call out. So the response, this is, this is basically allowing us to take the data coming back mm -hmm. and use it downstream in the flow. Absolutely. So now we have our call out, we have the action that we want. We've added now a new action that basically assigns the information we got from that call out to a value. And now what we want to do is we just want to make sure that the response of that call out is reflected in the user screen. So for example, sometimes an API can return an error. If it does, we want to make sure that the user is aware of that so that they know where to go back next time. Conversely, if it was a success, they should know that too. So in this case, we're going to map the error codes to a specific screen that they get. Really exciting stuff, Alex. Excellent. Now, one of the things about making callouts is how do you process the data that came back? You saw there that web calls return these blobs of JSON. Now, if you're a developer, that's not a problem. But if you're an admin working in Flow or a citizen builder using Flow, you need good tools to extract the pieces you need out of those web calls and do something useful with them. And for that, we have built and are about to release into beta a powerful new element in Flow Builder called Data Transform. What Data Transform is really about is taking some data that you hand it and shaping it, extracting it, combining it, mixing it up, applying formulas to it. And you can do this not just with an individual blob, but also a collection. And that's very important because a lot of the most powerful web calls return a collection, a set of records. So what you see here is two columns. And essentially, in this case, it's set up so that the left column is 
the collection of objects that are coming back from your web call out. And then the right side are, is a collection of product S objects, product Salesforce records. And so you'll see in a second just how that mapping enables you to work. You're also going to see in Ruben's demo how you don't just map things one to one. You can apply formulas. And formulas let you do things like take two fields from a product record, combine them together as a string to set up the shape that you need to send them out to an API that you need to call. And this is, once again, you can do this. You can do this as a developer. You can do this in Apex. I've written a lot of invocable actions that do this kind of transformation. But we're now able to provide everyone with a chance to do it through these simple visual tools. And let's see this in action. Awesome. So in this case, we're going to confront a problem that a lot of customers see, which is having to extract some data that they do care about from a ton of information that's available. So in this case, we have, like Alex talked about, a set of information on the left-hand side panel that we're getting from like some type of API request that we just got from. And then on the right side, we have the information that we actually care about. Again, we're able to map panel information from the left-hand side to the right-hand side. And like Alex mentioned, we can also combine multiple inputs into a single output thanks to a formula. For example, using min-max or average or some other mathematical combination. Some nice features that I like to call out here is the fact that you get some built-in error checking. You can't match a string to an integer directly. But because this is a Salesforce standard object, you can directly change the data types in either of these panels. Again, designed to streamline efficiency for your customer process. So in this case, we've got some matching that's happening, right? We've got each of the fields in the output panel mapped to some data that we're getting in the input, allowing us to extract it. In this case, we've selected everything on the inputs to see where I can map all of those to. And so we've got sort of this example where we have a lot of available information and then we want to extract it down to something that is more relevant to my use case. It also, excitingly enough, works the other way around, which is I have a larger amount of information and then I want to provide that to an external third party and that's what we're going to see next. So in this case, we have a larger amount of information that is available but a smaller subset of that that's required in order to make some type of external call. Maybe that's to my pet store supplier. Maybe that's to some other service inside or outside of Salesforce. In order to accomplish that, we do the same type of mapping. Again, really exciting stuff, Alex. Thanks, Ruben. So that is available for you to use. The final thing that I want to touch on is how you can do this across multiple flows at the same time. Because to a large degree, applications have a complexity that often is more than just one piece of one piece of functionality a lot of applications involve multiple people so we have built an orchestration layer an orchestration service on top of flow that allows you to combine multiple flows and get them to work together highly effectively uh, in multi-person environments and what you get with this, the th three of the biggest things that this provides that you don't get in your included flow, the first is this focus on the individual. So when you use flow orchestration, you're using flows to create work items. You're assigning those work items to individuals. Think in terms of an approval process. Think in terms of long-running processes that involve multiple departments in your organization. You're also getting really easy parallelization. As you know, a lot of things in organizations have to take place in parallel. You kick three things off, and then that fourth thing can't start until those first three are all done. Orchestration tracks all of that, notifies everyone that's involved, and makes it all easy. And then an important extra superpower of flow orchestration is that when you purchase it, you can take people in your organization that are not licensed Salesforce users and get them on Salesforce without buying them a user license. That's a big deal. Most big organizations have parts of the company that they don't ha have not put on Salesforce because the economics don't make sense. But a lot of those departments need to take participate. They need to take part in some of these business multi-departmental processes. So for example, if you have a compliance department and they need to approve something, 
Every time it flows through, but they're not on Salesforce, with flow orchestration, you can grant them a license to carry out their orchestration tasks right on Salesforce. So very potent. Uh, we're running a little low on time, so I'm not going to, I'm going to skip over a few of these orchestration slides. Uh, there's plenty of information about this as well on our site uh, and, part, and uh, ecosystem sites. Uh, our newest feature, Reactive Steps, makes orchestrations capable of listening for record changes, just like a record tr triggered flow. But instead of just starting the flow, they can start and stop individual steps and stages giving you a lot of control over when things, when things happen. So let's look at a quick demo. Thanks, Alex. So a lot of opportunity with respect to orchestration. And what we're going to do is just a little harbor tour of a pretty complex one that maps to a really, really frequent process that a lot of businesses and a lot of consumers face, which is buying a new car. So in this case, I have the flow of. Sorry, I'm, uh, it, this one needs to be a little bigger. And for some reason, it's not expanding. Take your so time. let's do this. Cool. So we have our flow for allowing a customer to purchase a new car. And there's a lot of steps that both need to run in parallel, but also need to function amongst a lot of distributed organizations. And what we're going to see is how flow orchestration allows us to coordinate all of that, including for members of that organization that might not necessarily be part of our system Salesforce suite. So right now I'm looking at test drive. I've already assigned that to someone. I've given it a priority and I've mapped it to a record ID. So we already know to whom that test drive will apply. And then we go to a price quote, right? So again, this is stuff that executes sequentially, things that like can be done in another flow. But then we go into a lot of parallelization. And it makes sense because there's a lot of possibilities after you give someone a price quote. There's the chance that they're on hold or not willing to pay or they don't want it necessarily, in which case you might want to direct them more towards your sales department or someone who can follow up later on a well check. Conversely, if they are looking at purchasing, there are a lot of different areas where you might want to interface. That could be a credit check. That could be a cash processing payment. In each of those p possible situations, you want to make sure that you're liaising correctly with the part of your organization that handles it. And most importantly, thanks to wall-on-wall -wall enablement, we're able to do that regardless of whether those parts of the organization are part of the Salesforce suite, thanks to contact opportunities like record.email and even record.sms, which allow for other forms of contacting them. Now we're ordering the vehicle itself, which allows for us to process the data and then send it to the correct customer. And subsequently, we take the follow-up actions, which looks like vehicle delivery. And then, like Alex talked about in customer follow-up, the opportunity to have a flow, this part of the flow triggered on a change to a record. So similar to a record-triggered flow, but instead the functionality is coming at the very end. Thanks, everyone. Excellent. Thank you, Ruben, for the great demos. Ruben's only been at Salesforce for a couple of weeks. I drafted him and <laughs> asked him to do all of the heavy lifting for my theater session. Let's see, yeah, I give him a hand. So in summary, I encourage you guys to think of Flow not just as a, this is my best automation tool, but also this is, a, this is really where the state of the art leading edge opportunities are to build applications faster, quicker, more effectively for my organization. Uh, let, we'll be here. If you have any questions, uh, feel free. Come around to the side here and enjoy the rest of your Dreamforce day. Thank you, Thanks. everyone. Thank you for watching. We would love to get your opinion on this content, so please leave us some feedback on the comments section below. If you did like this content, give that like button a tap. And, of course, if you want to see more videos like this, subscribe to the Salesforce Admins YouTube channel. If you want to learn more about being a Salesforce admin in general, head on over to admin.salesforce.com. Thanks again.